I'm here today with uh, Dan Oppenheimer. He's the president of Robinson Editions. How are you doing today, Dan? I'm fine, thank you. It's, uh, nice to talk to you. You as well. I'm excited to be here today. It's, uh, you know, I would love to start out by, uh, you know, one, hearing a little bit more about you and, and, and kind of, you know, maybe the, 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 the highlight version of your career growth. And then, uh, you know, also a little bit more about uh, Robinson Editions, if that would be, if you could uh, walk us through that. Sure. Well, I've been in it for a long time. I started in 1975 uh, as a really a stained glass studio. And the, it, in the 70s, stained glass was real popular. It had fallen out of, of uh, vogue in the 60s completely. And, but we had in the 70s, we had uh, kind of, uh, I guess you'd call it the hippie arts and crafts movement. And a lot of people were making stained glass. And I decided, you know, I was just fresh out of college. I decided, you know, that I happened to go to a church when I was growing up that was a, had a lot of beautiful stained glass windows in it. And uh, actually a fellow moved out of the building I was in and left an old stained glass window in it that was broken up. And I had learned how to cut glass working in a hardware store in high school and knew a little bit about electronics and dust soldering. And uh, anyway, I've restored this window uh, by going through the trash of a major studio that was down the street about six or seven blocks. I mean, I didn't care. I was 20 something years old. So, <laughs> but I, I restored this window and the guy came back looking for it and uh, paid me hundred dollars to, for the work I did. And I, it wow. was an aha moment. So I started a little stained glass studio, and once we got going, this was in 75, I believe, I uh, went out to Holiday Inns, which was, at that time, uh, they had a division called HSD, and what that was is if you bought a Holiday Inn franchise, you could go out to HSD, and it was all Holiday Inn owned, and you could order everything you could possibly need for a ho hotel. I mean, they, they had, you know, fabric, carpet, everything, case goods, you name it. And it was run by, you know, kind of top designers at Holiday Inns. And uh, that went on for quite a while until they sold. But I went out there and sold them on the idea of, uh, well, I didn't sell them. They were just actually looking for it. They needed booth dividers because they were putting in full service restaurants in all their hotels. And uh, they had... These booth dividers are very similar to Perkins restaurants. I mean, I don't even know which came first, the chicken or the egg in that case. Because <laughs> they just, I mean, they were identical. They had booths backed up to each other, and you had a, you know, 18 by 60 inch space where you could see the people next to you, unless there was some kind of decorative panel. And that ended up being at first stained glass, uh, later etched glass. Okay. And that just led me off into a lot of different directions. Uh, architectural decorative arts wise and uh so it, it, it in as we started doing a lot of etched glass form and i decided in it was about 78 that there ought to be able to be a way to do it photographically as opposed to hand cutting with an exacto blade on a carbon paper trace design on a rubber mask and started looking into photographic processes. And I came up with a solution. And about that time I met this fellow, Jack Robinson, thus Robinson Editions. And it turns out, well, a lot of things I've learned since he died in 97, but uh, he was a uh, Vogue magazine freelance photographer in the late sixties and very early seventies until Diana Vreeland, uh, who was editor in chief in those days, was fired for taking the magazine oh, so avant garde that the bean counters, they started losing advertising revenue. <laughs> I mean, there was full frontal nudity in that magazine at that time. I mean, it was kind of amazing. But anyway, Jack heard about my process and he came down and introduced himself. And he was working for another stained glass studio. As a matter of fact, it was the one I was going through the garbage can years earlier getting scrap glass from anyway we became pretty good friends and uh he uh he died suddenly from pancreatic cancer in 97 and left me his photographic 
the state, uh, which would amount to about 250,000 negatives and copyrights of wow. popular icons that were arriving on the scene in the late 60s and early 70s. So it's a who's who of American pop icons. We, we license those images virtually every day because uh, it's just a who's who of, like I say, pop culture. Most recently with James Caan, he just died. And, and on NBC News, there, were, there are pictures showed up because Getty Images handles them. But in any case, that photographic etching process, it was used first successfully to, um, to etch the 55,000 names at the time in the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial in Washington, D.C. Wow. with Maya Lin who was the architect on that. And then we did another pro couple of projects with her actually, Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, and uh, I believe the Women of Yale. Uh, anyway, that's the last monument she did, and we still stay in touch. But uh, that led me off into other directions from elevator door decorating to, uh, in case of fire, do not use elevators, use stairway custom type fonts. And, Dover Elevator was located here then. It's now Tyson Krupp. But uh, for a number of years, we just uh, we did a lot of etching on stainless steel and bronze and marble and glass and just whatever architects could think of. And that led me into, well, we, we, we had to move because we ran out of space in our original location. And at that time, I had uh, figured out that these architects were building these buildings that had these fancy elevators would be a good possible uh, client for architectural signage throughout the building. Yep. Like if it was marble, I could, you know, so I started making signs, samples that I was going to go and market to the architects. I was already doing the elevator graphics. And uh, anyway, I invited the Holiday Inn managers from HSD over to my new facility. This is in about 83, I guess. And uh, I couldn't get them out of my sign sample room. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, they were, that stuff was all Velcroed to the walls. They'd pull them off and look at them. And, you know, and I'm standing back watching and just didn't dawn on me that Holiday Inns was not happy with their sign systems. So we, you know, that afternoon I gathered everybody up and I said, look, we're starting a hotel sign business. <laughs> and we did <laughs> and it turned into really the largest i think the largest interior sign company for hotels in the country i sold it in 2002 to hotel signs in chattanooga and they're still carrying on it i think i'm sure they are the largest wow and, uh, but uh really really good folks but it gave me a chance to kind of not have to deal with so many people and then then i got the call about Jack Robinson's photographs and thus started Robinson Editions. And so we began to market to uh, contract framers mostly and interior designers, uh, this ability to produce art for, for hotel guest rooms. And as at the time, the only thing really available to them was uh, offset lithographs through publishers, art publishers for hotels but it was really problematic because you'd run out of stock or they'd be the wrong size or there wasn't enough of them or the wrong color, a million different things. It was just real hard for designers to choose art. And so they had standards that were produced and uh, by the, the hotel franchisors and it might just be you know silly flowers or whatever. And every hotel had the same thing. And then here we did this New York hotel where we had New York images. There were a thousand rooms. And uh, it just became clear to me real quickly because I knew the business uh, that all art should be regional. And, but that's not practical to go and find an artist in some obscure town, Jonesboro, Arkansas, and try to teach them the price points of hotels and, and uh, you know, licensing their images that they probably never sold more than one original of. And so we went to photography because there was, it was just the beginning of the digital age and digital cameras were now everywhere. And 
uh, online photographic archives that were regional geographically and we were able to meet the need through those through those methods and through photoshop photoshop has been very very good to me <laughs> uh, <laughs> now i mean because we had you know you'd, we'd show a client a bunch of different say 15 or 20 photographs of the area or something that reminded you of the area and then they'd come back and they said we'd like it but we really like the sky to little be a little more blue green or you know would you add a red door to this and of course you just go into photoshop and you can do all that stuff that's what we did and uh, still do to this day and uh anyway that's that's been the main business for the longest time now we, along the way we've done a lot of other things sculpture just you name it, we're still a general uh, full architectural decorative arts services company. I got a job yesterday where our quote request for a couple of guitars made out of half inch round rod, mm -hmm. eight feet wide and, you know, four feet tall. And we, it's sculpture, one of one off sculptures. We get that quite a bit because it's just hard to find. And unless you know somebody that's you know in that business and there are not many people that do what we do that i know of i mean i can put them on one, count them on one hand and we're just used to price points that are more in line with what hotels really like to spend which is as little as they can uh, <laughs> so we you know we kind of geared the business that way what's the least expensive way this is four floors of it's 27,000 square feet of production. And uh, there's so many dis different disciplines that go on here from our printing area to dark room to metal shop to, oh, it's just it's kind of boggling, really. You can't figure out how to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Dan, it sounds like I mean, you've had a great perspective of, you know, kind of the way art has impacted the hospitality industry, you know, over the last, you know, 50 years, really. That's, well, 45. Yeah, it, that's it's absolutely phenomenal. So if you, you know, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, what are some of the trends that you're seeing, um, you know, kind of that, that we've ridden through maybe through the recessions and and kind of where are we headed? Well, you know, from an art standpoint, like I said, it's it's mostly gone from just generic art to regional imagery, and that's the biggest change. And that's only because of the the uh, development of of uh, digital printing, where it's on demand printing, and it's pretty much everywhere now. I don't even think that there's a lot of films that you can't even get developed anymore. The only way you can have things done is through digital printing. And even some of the offset presses are, are digital presses or partially digital, digital presses now. But uh, so we've seen it go from, like I say, silly flowers or abstracts to very, very pinpointed regional imagery. Like, with, oh, we just did a job in Mobile where we used, uh, actually in that case, a lot of vintage Mobile imagery. And uh, by vintage, I mean 100 year old images of uh, Mobile. You go to the to the local historical society and various other sources and get a collection of images of, of uh, historic buildings. That, but were taken 100 years ago and look like it. And uh, if your hotel and this one was in the historic downtown Mobile area, they, they just loved it. You know, and we uh, clean them up in Photoshop again and print. If it's a 250 room hotel, and I think this was, you know, it's 250 of this and 250 of that, 250 of something else. And uh, then the commercial areas. And those are also vintage images in this case. Uh, so from vintage to contemporary, depending on where the property is and what the owner wants. Uh, that's that's what we provide is we put together a gallery of images for them to select from. They critique them, ask them to do different things, make them sepia, like I say, put a red door in, in one. Uh, some hotels have standard designs, but 
the tendency, even the specs on say Hilton, for example, it says it's, they want regional art. Uh, they tell it, the designers, it's now up to you to provide the regional art and uh, you just got to get it approved. And it's that way with so many different brands now. And some have kind of generic architectural images and geometric Im images. But I think if everybody realized you could get regional art, uh, pretty much everybody would do it. It just makes more sense. I remember when I, I was staying, at a, this happened to be in Mobile a lot, way earlier than this job, but I was in a hotel that was on the bay and they had these silly flowers on the wall. And if, you know, <laughs> at night you shut the windows, you didn't know where you were. I mean, I knew where I was because I, you know, signed in, checked in. Right. But there was nothing in the room that told me I was in Mobile. And uh, I came back and it was, a, it happened to be a Hampton Inn. And I just, I was close enough to these folks to be able to kind of raise hell and say, you know, you got, <laughs> this needs to be regional art. You, this is just crazy, you know, to put petunias in the, you know, in the art. So I think that kind of hit home to a lot of the designers. It's, it's fortunate to have these people as friends because I can be real honest with them. I mean, I just recently I had a neighbor that, lived across the street there was a senior designer at, at hilton and and uh yeah real casual conversations but yeah geez michelle why don't you do this or you know. <laughs> so it's it's fun and uh i've just always been able to approach them at a little bit higher level than than uh, now i'm getting too old now to, they're all youngsters now <laughs> so so you've got, uh, you know, obviously the ability to do this kind of stuff on demand. You know, are you seeing a lot of of like custom things? Like you mentioned, the sculptures and things like that. Is that is that something you're starting to see more and more of as we're coming out of the yes, pandemic? Absolutely. And so, well, you know, the one trend I'll tell you that I remember very distinctly starting to happen, which was probably about ten years ago. We developed. Uh, it was for Disney actually uh, a canvas coating process where we were able to print on canvas and then coat it with a protective because I mean they've got kids in these rooms. Oh, of course, they, they, you my, know, they my kids. Very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, greasy hands. Oh look, there's you know little Adam or whatever, and they go cut the right. art. You know. So they asked us to develop a, a, a thicker coating, which we did. And I bought, gosh, three or four coating machines before I found one that would actually work. And uh, anyway, but then I figured, you know, we'd start to see canvas jobs. We didn't. I mean, I went probably a solid year before we saw another canvas job. And now I'm a, virtually every quote I get uh, has canvas on it. I'm looking at, let's see, this one came in yesterday and it is print on wood, print on dye bond, acrylic, and canvas. By canvas, in this case, <laughs> it happens to be wall covering. But I mean, it's 588 rooms. Right. I mean, it's they're, they're just huge jobs. So, I so mean, it's, that, it's that custom feel, but on a large scale. Exactly. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it's all custom. I mean, this one is, uh, came in July 12th. It's 70 printed wood or canvas another 70 printed wood these are 36 by 42 then mm. paper paper then three canvas job i mean it's just you know it's that it's just a lot of of course a lot of stuff so that's what i've been doing the last well few weeks maybe into months is just quoting and quoting and quoting and getting jobs and getting jobs most of the ones we quote we get and uh, matter of fact almost all of them okay but, uh, but it's just more i'm seeing more non-traditional as opposed to paper like i say canvas wood dye bond acrylic you name it uh we just did some wood panels for guest room sample room that had uh medium uh, which is a, like a thick gel with brush strokes 
over mm. printed on wood and then go leaf on top of that. And they're beautiful. But they're very different, and it's a little more expensive than you know just a printed piece of paper. But it's very effective in a in a guest room. So very neat. Well, it sounds like uh, you know it sounds like you've benefited from innovation over the years. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Would you you know I, obviously you know this is with everything becoming more custom, this space is going to have to grow, right? There's going to have to be more people within this space in order just to keep up with the demand, it sounds like, is that, would that be accurate or? I don't know. I mean, you know, the thing is, is a lot of contract framers, uh, I mean, anybody can go and buy a digital printer now. Of course. There's more to it than, than that. You've really got to know, like I say, Photoshop and other, other programs you've got to have to do it. They're pushing us. You know, you, you put out, the, like I just described, the wood panels with the medium arm and the gold leaf. You put that out there, designers see it. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, let me, let's, what if they can do this? And then that comes in. And so it just keeps growing as designers become more educated as to what is actually available. The stuff we do is kind of, well, it's just not everybody can do it. And it's just okay. because we've got, 45, 50 years of just being here and artists that have been on staff for, gosh, I've had some since the seventies, but, uh, and we bring, we bring in new talent. I mean, the, all my latest hires have been people in their, I'd say their twenties and thirties. Okay. So, you know, we have, a, we had a art Academy here and that was a real help. For a long time to it just produced a lot of artists with nothing better to do than be a waitress and uh or a waiter bartender so they'd come get a job with me and uh developed a lot of talent that way over the years awesome well i i mean it's a, a very unique career path but i mean obviously it runs right through the hospitality industry i mean absolutely you know, the, we all, uh, you know, any, any part of the industry has art in it. Art is a part of what we do as an industry. It's that unique experience. So it, it sounds like this is a thriving and alive and well business. Well, it, it is now. I mean, you know, we went through <laughs> a 10 year slump, you know, because of the 2008 crash and then, you know, just very slowly build back from that. But, you know, now even in commercial buildings are almost required to hold off some percentage for art you see art, public art all the time and uh art and buildings it's just much more look at uh, uh what do they call century 21 out of louisville they're making art as a uh no it's what is it i forget the name of it but it's a it's a hotel company a boutique hotel company and it's based around art I think the owners had a large art collection and they Is just it, uh, 21C maybe 21C. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think, uh, you know, this is incredibly relevant now. I mean, people are traveling now more than, you know, I think from a leisure standpoint, they're, they're traveling an incredible amount. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible and a great way uh, you know, to be able to tie people's vacation into something they'll remember, because obviously art is is transcendent and, and things that people will remember. So, uh, you know, absolutely great and, and absolutely love that. So. So, Dan, let me ask you another question here. You know, as you are, you know, you've, you've had a great purview of the industry for for quite a while now. Uh, you know, as people are coming into the industry, right, these 20 year olds, these 30 year olds that you're hiring. You know, what kind of advice are you giving them uh, to, to try to lead to be uh, successful in, in a career like this? Well, you know, I almost kiddingly say you have to be born into the business to get in it. And it's it's I, I, it's least it's that way here because the designers that that I met in the 70s and 80s, it's their kids now are coming into the business. And the same thing's true with reps. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get either of my children to uh, <laughs> come into the business. One of them uh, is a software engineer. The other one is in nursing school. Uh, although they're seriously interested in it, it's just, you know, the, the kids today make more money than they did when I was starting out. 
at least you do if you're a software engineer right. and, uh, and a nurse. I mean, they're high demand, you know. But I know other companies that, that the kids have definitely, uh, we one of the largest contract framers in America, I can't name their name, but they're, they're in Chicago. And both the sons of the owners are in the business totally. I deal with them on a daily basis and uh, multiple times a day, actually. And they're great. They love the company. They love the business. Their parents are great. They're still involved. Uh, but again, they were born into it. And right. you know, it just seems to me to be, it would be real hard to go out and just start a new business in this day and age. And uh, unless you had, I don't know. I mean, I'm just old school and not as tech savvy as he's young. I mean, I guess what you do now is you write a program to you know, help hotels or restaurants or whatever, whatever it is to, I, I just don't see a lot of fresh faces in, I still see the old guard still okay. kind of at the top, but the, they're, they're hiring youngsters to come in and uh, learn the business. I mean, it's just got to be the way it is. It's always been that way, really. One generation passes the baton to the next. And that's what's going on. I mean, I guess you see it more than I do in, in hospitality management. But of I'm course. just looking at it from a standpoint of design. I mean, we interviewed some, a company not too long ago, and I was in the boardroom with them. And there was the girl that owned it was in her 40s. Uh, and uh, they were very successful contract designers, and, but every one of the people that she had hired were in their 20s and 30s. Every mm -hmm. one of them sitting around this table. And I mean, I'm the, I feel like this old guy, and I'm not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll call you experienced, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that's the right. you've got it's a lot experience. of you've got a lot of experience, a lot to offer the industry. You know, I think if you are in and you, and you have the ability to be able to grow generationally i think that's awesome it sounds like there's also a lot of people out there who are willing to give you a shot as long as you're willing to put the work in so absolutely awesome well i i think that that's probably you know a great takeaway is that you know once you get in make the most of it right make the absolutely. most of it you know and think long term i mean you could be handing this business over to your kids uh, you know you could be handing this uh th this business over you know generationally not just you know, what you can do today and what you can do tomorrow. It's, you know, this is something that could live on for quite a while. Yeah, well, it's totally true, especially on the ownership side of the hospitality, because, you know, the guys that started the hotel companies, their kids come along and they take over. I mean, what, you know, what, what better are they going to do than take over the ownership of 10 or 15 hotels? Right. And it just, it, it is, it's just a, once you get in, I always used to think, that I would look at general managers, for example, when back, I'll give you a case in point back in, in 92, when ADA took effect, mm -hmm. I convinced, I didn't convince, I just went and explained to Hilton at the time, no, it was Promise at the time that had uh, embassy suites. I said, look, they're going to hit hotels first because it's just, you can go straight to the parent company and say, your hotels need to be in compliance. Of course. So, the, the easiest thing y'all can do right now is send me or, or one of my employees out to every hip embassy suites in the country and write a sign plan so that you can have a binder on your shelf with photographs. And here's your plan to redo your signage. Of course. And I took the best trips. I mean, I would take the trip. <laughs> to, you know, well, I just, you know. Hawaii and the Pacific Northwest, wherever. And I told them it took two or three days to do one of these sign plans. Of course, it took about an hour. And I had, I mean, he's walked through the building, write down the signs, take pictures. But I had right. a car and a room for a couple of nights. And I'd just take off and drive around and familiarize myself with the beautiful countryside. Love it. But I, I met the general managers every time. And it was real obvious to me that they, they were the king of a little fiefdom. They, they were out in the sticks or wherever and corporate didn't bother them. I mean, they right. maybe called in once a week or sent reports in, but nobody came down. I mean, they were the king of the castle. They lived on site for the most part, but they never knew where they were going to go next. And uh, it's just, 
it got it gets in your blood and once a general manager always a general manager or rise up through the ranks but it made me realize how uh not incestuous but what a family the hospitality industry actually is and i really appreciate that uh because i'm i consider myself part of it but not from a operational side just from a yeah. provider side you know when kimmins wilson started holiday inns he went to different companies around town and he started i was i think it was about 30 30 different businesses that did different things that would like a company he'd start one that did drapes somebody that did just the wrought iron uh rails for the exterior corridor hotels or just the case goods or just i mean it was like i say about 30 different businesses that he started or became partners with and gave holiday in business he didn't do quite the same with me but in effect he did just psychologically and uh uh it's just it. like it's just, yeah it's just an it's it's kind of an incestuous business it is but, it is definitely a family business i mean I, I will tell you that as somebody who's second generation in the hotel industry i can tell you it's uh it's definitely a family business and how, what was how is your how are you second generation uh my father's uh worked for uh marriott for for decades and uh, yeah. i did about 20 years with marriott myself uh there you so go. absolutely it was uh it, it was it's a, it's a great company and and yeah, uh, you is. know it's a great industry i do a lot of marriott business <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, I tell you what, Dan, I appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much for your time today. It's my uh, pleasure. Anytime. You know, congratulations on your success. It sounds like you're doing awesome. And, uh, you know, keep contributing. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. And I will. All right. Thanks, Dan. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.